Ukraine Today is joined by Senior Research Associate of Ukra Canadian Institute of Ukraine Studies of University of Alberta, Canada, Mr. Taras Kuzio. Mr. Kuzio, welcome to Ukraine Today. Thank you. Mr. Kuzio, I understand you're now writing a book about Donbass. Can you please say a few words about this book? What is it about? In 2013, um, I uh, went into conversations with, with a fund called the Ukraine Studies Fund, which is based in the United States. Um, and suggested the idea to them to write um, a book on the Donbass. This is 2013, so Yanukovych is still in power, no Euromaidan. And the reason was is that uh, you have this uh, very powerful president and party regent in power in Ukraine, but in the English language there's hardly anything published on Donbass party regents. So my, my suggestion was it would be good to get something published in, about this field. By coincidence, um, the project which was about this big became this big because, of course, we have Euromaidan, the overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych, and then conflict in Donbass and war with Russia. So, so the book has become very topical, very sexy now, um, and um, it's expanded um, because there are so many factors now, far more than they were three years ago, two to three years ago. So I've been doing um, a lot more research than I would have needed to, to have done if there had been no Euro Maidan or no war in Donbass. So talking about the field trips, how many times you have been to Donbass and uh, what are your impressions? Well, I've traveled uh, pretty much to every major city in eastern and southern Ukraine, Kharkiv, Mipetrovsk, Zaporizhia, Odessa, uh, to Donetsk when it was the Euromaidan, to western Donbass, Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, which is controlled by Ukrainian forces, now to Mariupol and Volnovakha. Um, so I pretty much covered every major region, except maybe Kherson, Mykolaiv. And um, the re the, what to me is interesting is that I get a better sense of how eastern Ukraine is differentiated, it's diverse. It's not one region. Um, um, very often journalists, um, Western journalists, write very uh, sloppily. They write about East Ukraine as one unit, as one kind of region, in the same way as they write about West Ukraine. And in fact, it's different. Um, in the East, uh, the Donbass is as different to the rest of East Ukraine as Galicia is as different to the rest of West Ukraine. Um, you can't sort of say the whole, the, these entire regions are all the same. Um, and, and you see this in the Donbass and Crimea because those are the two regions of a kind of eastern or Russian-speaking Ukraine which um, were always more Soviet in their national identity um, and more pro-Russian and pro-separatist. Um, so for me what's interesting is to compare these regions to Donbass. Um, and I would divide, the, and, I, and my research would be looking at dividing the region into three groups. You have the Donbass and Crimea, which is one particular area, which explains why conflict broke out in Donbass and why Vladimir Putin's idea for a new so-called new Russia has failed because he didn't receive support outside of Donbass. Even within the Donbass, it was limited to the eastern part of Donetsk and southern part of Luhansk. Then the second group, I would call it a swing regions, Kharkiv, Odessa, where you had a lot of uh, violence on the streets of Kharkiv, Odessa in March to May of last year and where there's been uh, some terrorist attacks more recently um, and these were where you have a bit of support for separatism especially in the case of Kharkiv you had political tourists brought in from Russia because it's on the border with Russia um, uh, but it wasn't as high as in Donetsk if, if separatism was supported by say 30 percent by separatism I mean um, an independent Donbass or integration with Russia both of those together, 30%. In Kharkiv, it would be maybe 10 15%. In Odessa, maybe 10%. And then you have the other four regions, Zaporizhia, Dnipropetrovsk, Kherson, Mykolaiv, where there's zero separatism. Um, and these are completely pro-Ukrainian, even though Putin included them within New Russia, and, and which have, uh, where you've had a growth of pro-Ukrainian pro sentiment. And for me, um, what's fascinating when you look at this over the 25-year period since Ukraine became independent, the USSR collapsed, is you have three waves of nation building. You have in the late 1980s, you have um, Western Ukraine pushing Ukraine towards independence. Um, then by um, the Orange Revolution, 2004, Central Ukraine joins Western Ukraine. 
and, and that propels the Orange Revolution, Viktor Yushchenko to power. And now you have a third wave where the eastern and southern Ukraine is joining in, and, you, and so you have the growth of Russian-speaking Ukrainian patriotism, um, which has now become actually very trendy and fashionable um, in some ways. And, and this is fascinating um, because um, the, ma the majority of volunteers in, e in even the nationalist battalions, like Pravi Sektor and, and Azov, which are often called Nazi in the West, the majority of those are Russian speakers, not, not Ukrainian speakers. Um, I uh, interviewed mem uh, the members of the Azov battalion in Mariupol, and they say they have, like Pravi Sektor, they have 50 Russian volunteers from Russia. So how can they be Ukrainian Nazis if they have Russians in their b battalion? Russia and Russian TV sees only two types of people in Ukraine. Those who support Ukraine being within the Russian sphere of influence, which it sees as little Russians, which you can pat on the head like a little dog, um, and fascists. So there are fascists and little Russians. There's nobody else in Ukraine. If you're a supporter of the Orange Revolution, if you're a supporter of the Euro Maidan, if you're a supporter of EU or NATO membership, you're a fascist, automatically. Very Soviet approach. If you're not, if you want to be part of Ruski Mir, the Russian world, then you're a good little Russian-Ukrainian. It's fascinating to see how Putin and his leadership and most Russians simply cannot understand the concept of a patriotic Russian-speaking Ukrainian. For them, it's impossible to understand. Because if you're Russian-speaking, that means you're Ruski, and Russian means Eastern Slavic. And therefore, if you're Russian, because like Putin said there are 17 million Russians in Ukraine, which means there are 17 million Russian speakers. But for him, they're all Ruski. They're all, therefore all part of the Ruski Mir, all part of... And the way he defines that is that Eastern Slavs are all uh, Russians. Now, this is something that goes back to the 19th century. It's also something very similar to what the German leader, Adolf Hitler, said, that all Germanic speakers should be part of Germany. So this pan-Germanism or pan-Russianism has actually got a lot of similarities. So basically, your book will debunk the myth, uh, which is widely spread in the West, that the, you, first of all, that in Ukraine there is a clear division between East and West, that Western Ukrainians are fighting with Eastern Ukrainians, and that basically this, what they call conflict, is somewhat similar to a civil war. It's not a civil war. It's, um, what this conflict is about is not, not a language conflict either. It's a civilizational conflict. This is what the uh, vice president of the World Jewish Congress, uh, Josef Zitzel, calls it like this. It's a conflict between um, those who believe that um, Ukrainians, whether they're Russian speakers or Ukrainian speakers or both, many people are both, remember, um, want to be, live in an independent country, want to live in a country that's part of the European civilization sphere, or those who have a different viewpoint, who want to be part of the Ruski Mir, of the Russian world, um, who have a very Soviet identity. And language here isn't a factor. Language is... In the, is, is, is there, of course, in the conflict, but it's not a major driving force. The major driving force is, of course, Putin's um, personal anger um, and frustration that the person he chose to be his Kadyrov in Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, was, you know, he thought he, he, his way of dealing with prob problem areas, like with Chechnya, is to find a puppet pay him lots of money, and then he rules it on, on Russia's behalf. This was the Chechen model. So Yanukovych was supposed to be the Ukrainian Kadyrov, and that didn't happen because neither Yanukovych or Putin understood that Ukraine is not Russia. I mean, they should have read Kuchma's book from 2004, The Ukraine is Not Russia. Um, so th this, these divisions in Ukraine are there, of course, there's regional diversity, but there's regional diversity in many countries. Um, my mother's Italian. You can't get more regionally diverse in Italy. If you fly from Palermo in Sicily, as I've done, to Milan in northern Italy, it's a bigger contrast in identity than Donetsk Lviv. Um, but they are all part of the one country. So we have uh, a conflict within the realm of Donbass created by criminal leaders in Russia, which has led to the deaths of thousands of people, and thousands of military casualties on both sides.
um, driven over, and over, over ideology and ideas which are totally out of place in the 21st century, um, which hark back to the 19th century of the 1930s, and which, um, which are not realistic, which don't apply to Ukraine, because um, you, you know, you, if, if you can get him to one volunteer battalion, Azov or Pravi Sector, Ukrainian nationalists, Russians from Russia, and Russian-speaking Ukrainians from Eastern Ukraine, then what's the problem? Mr. Kuzu, can we talk a bit about terminology? Um, a lot of media in the Western, uh, Western media are calling the events happening in Ukraine as conflict. You yourself are referring to this as conflict. Um, it seems that conflict is something the country is responsible itself for, 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 uh, for beginning, for, for starting, and, and not being able to, to cope with. Whereas Ukrainian media is already calling it a full-fledged war, Ukraine and Russian war. Mm -hmm. How correct it is to, to, to label the events happening in eastern Ukraine as the war, or is it still the conflict? I think that um, at the moment it's, it's what would be, we would call something which is in between terrorism and a full war, somewhere in the middle. So it would be called low-intensity conflict, um, because it's not a full-scale war between two Russian and you know, Ukrainian armies. If Russia was to try to capture Mariupol, it would have to move from hybrid war to full war, to full invasion. It could no longer do it with a few thousand uh, troops. We'd need 50,000 to 100,000 troops. Then we're talking about a full-scale war. So in terms of terminology, I would call it a low-intensity conflict. It's far, far more of a, um, a violent conflict than in Northern Ireland. I, I grew up in Britain, so Northern Ireland was a conflict. But that were, over 30 years, only 700 soldiers and police died in Ukraine in one year over you know 6,000, 7,000 soldiers and civilians um, died. So it's bigger than a terrorist conflict that we had in say in Northern Ireland but it's not a full-scale war either yet, yet. Um, that all depends on whether Russia decides to try and support the separatists in taking and trying to take control of the whole of the Donbass which is what Alexander Zakharchenko says is his goal. But he can't do that without Russian troops. And the problem that Putin has is that the longer he waits, the more dangerous, more, more or less likely he will be to be successful. Because the longer he waits, the better will be trained Ukrainian troops, better armed will be Ukrainians. Uh, President Obama will no longer be in power, so there will be American arms c coming to Ukraine. I mean, there are already six countries training Ukrainian troops. So he has a problem with that. Plus, Putin needs to keep a culture of conflict alive because he has st state Duma and presidential elections down the road. So he needs to keep the conflict alive for Russians to, um, to be mobilized around nationalism and, and around fighting Ukrainian fascists and fighting NATO in Ukraine. The problem that um, why this is unstable is that in Moldova, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, the separatists, with Russian help, won. They took control of Nagorno-Karabakh, Transnistria, and South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And the, the Moldovans, Georgians, and Azerbaijanis lost. In this conflict, neither side has won. And I don't think this will be ever free from conflict in this region as long as Vladimir Putin is alive. And if he's alive, then he'll be Russian president. He'll never leave office. You said Russia did not get what it wanted. What is your opinion? What, did they, what was their ultimate goal? What was the ultimate goal of the Novorossiya project? Was it supposed to be an independent state or was it supposed to be similar as in Crimea, integrated with Russia? Um, I think he, he has, um, his big grand plan was to have a, um, a kind of a, uh, lots of public support in these eight Russian-speaking regions of so-called New Russia, uh, who would then invite in Russian troops. Um, I don't think he, you know, the separatists wanted to be annexed to Russia like the Crimeans, but uh, Putin prefers to have these uh, separatist regions inside Ukraine, which would then influence uh, Kiev's domestic and foreign policy. But his goals are obvious. Their goals are to demand a, a federalism, a federal structure for Ukraine. This is something that they demanded for Moldova many years ago for Georgia, and a federal structure where the separatist region has tremendous influence over domestic and foreign policy of that country. 
Now, this is a federal system that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Texas does not control American foreign policy. Uh, Quebec does not control Canadian policy. This is uh, ludicrous. No federal government in the world would allow a region to control foreign policy. For, in a federal system, foreign, foreign policy and military policy is controlled by the federal government, not by the local government. Local government controls taxes, uh, you know, housing, social security, and things like this. Um, and secondly, he wants to change the leader of the country. So again, it's unrealistic. Uh, how can you close or, or overturn two elections held last year, presidential and parliamentary elections, which were recognized by the West, recognized by the OCE, European Union, Council of Europe, as being free. Russia says, no, no, this, we should replace these elections with pro-Russian leaders. How is that possible? How do you, where do you find them? Pro-Russian sentiment in Ukraine is now pretty much zero. Um, you know, 75% uh, of Ukrainians despise Vladimir Putin. He's the most negative foreign leader in the country today. Where do you find these pro-Russian leaders? Um, and who's going to vote for them? And thirdly, he wants uh, Ukraine to no longer aspire to be a member of EU and NATO. Mr. Kuzi, and my final question, with, uh, with, with, your, with Friday, with the research you're doing for your book, with your field trips, what is your uh, projection of the future of the Donbass region? Will it stay with Ukraine? I think the Donbass, I think that the likely option is maybe in the short term some kind of frozen conflict um, um, because, uh, and then eventually um, I think um, what will happen will be the existing ceasefire line will become a new border. I think that's what eventually will happen um, because this region inside the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics will become no no-go areas, no economy, twilight zones, um, and they'll be pretty much under Russian de facto occupation, and Ukraine will continue to ignore them. So I think you'll have a frozen conflict which over time will create a new border in the east. I mean, Ukraine has the option to eventually, if it wants, to try and recapture these areas, but the problem with that is that it could only defeat the separatists, and the separatists are likely to be backed by Russian armed forces, as we saw uh, since August of last year, and that would mean a full war with, with, U with Russia. I mean, Ukraine needs peace to do reforms and to integrate with Europe. It doesn't need war. I mean, that's, uh, that it needs all of the, it needs peace and kind of security and stability. So I, I, I would suspect that, that frozen conflict and then probably eventually this will turn into a new border. Dr. Kuzio, many thanks for your time and many thanks for coming to us. This was Volodymyr Solhu for Ukraine Today, together with Senior Research Associate of Canadian Institute for Ukraine Studies of University of Alberta, Canada, Mr. Taras Kuzio. Thank you for watching us.